Thank you very much for coming. We are thrilled to see so many of you here in this lovely place, and we would like to thank Stefan Dickers, sitting over there in the corner, who presides over this wonderful library um, from his perch in there in the archive for allowing us to use this magnificent place with the wonderful ceiling. Uh, it's thrilling to see so many of you here and to have a chance to look back and also to look forward. My name is Casper Melville. I am the Chief Executive of the Rationalist Association and the editor of New Humanist magazine. I know many of you, but not all of you. And um, the program will go like this. I'm going to talk just for a short time about the history of the organization and about the archive. Then I will introduce Laurie Taylor, our chair, who will introduce our guest speaker. And then, according to our um, schedule, it will be time for more mingling. You have actually been mingling already, uh, in case you didn't know. You have been mingled. Um, so. Without further ado, oh, I should also say it's being filmed tonight. You might have <coughs> twigged that from the fact that there are cameras here. I hope none of you will be embarrassed in front of your local minister or imam. Uh, if you really don't want to appear on film, please do come and let me know, and I will pixelate your face. Uh, so I'd like to welcome also the people who are watching this online. Hello. They're, not now. It's not being broadcast live. It will go up later on. So I just want to set the scene. I mean, here we are in a wonderful historic building. We are a wonderful historic organization. I want to set the scene for you a little bit. And I'll start with a little story. It begins sometime in the mid-19th century with two brothers, John and Charles Watts. They are Methodists. They are from Bristol. Um, John's the slightly older one. Charles is quite a precocious young man and starts doing public speaking uh, from the age of 14. He starts what you might call preaching. I'm not quite sure if he was preaching the gospel, but he was certainly talking in public about social issues from a very young age. Uh, his older brother, John, was working for some printers, had work in a printing office, and through this, he came into contact with some of the prominent secularists of the age, people like Charles Bradlaugh and many others. You can read all about people like that in, in the archive and uh, all throughout this building. Um, so they met uh, uh, Charles Bradlaugh and they met uh, Holyoke and many others, and through this, John got a job editing the National Reformer, which was Bradlaugh's uh, radical newspaper of the time. At this point, secularism, of course, was wrapped up with radical politics and all kinds of social turmoil. Um, in 1864, the brothers founded a printers themselves. They called it Watts & Co., and they moved into their <coughs> premises in Johnson's Court, just off Fleet Street. Tragically, John died very young at the age of 32, and at that point, Charles took over the publishing business and continued to tour the land uh, talking about social issues and radical issues, and he declared himself an atheist, which at that point in time was not an easy thing to declare yourself, but he did. Charles then got together with Bradlaugh, and in 1866 they formed the National Secular Society. The National Sec Secular Society you'll probably still be aware of. He's going strong. They still speak up very trenchantly for secularism. And um, that lasted for a little over 11 years when uh, Charles... Watts and Bradlaugh fell out rather drastically over a court case. I won't go into the details. They published a book called The Fruits of Philosophy, which recommended the use of birth control. They were then uh, put on trial for obscenity. At that point, I think Bradlaugh, as was his way, wanted to use it as a kind of rallying cry. He wanted to stand up and denounce religion from the, the pulpit of the dock. And Charles Watts wasn't really into that. And in fact, he pleaded guilty and withdrew himself from the prosecution. <laughs> And I think that was a cleavage, which uh, there are echoes of that kind of cleavage continuing perhaps to this day. Anyway, Charles, together with two other secular people, uh, George Holyoke and George Foote, set up the British Secular Union, which was a kind of short-lived alternative or rival group to the NSS. didn't last very long. And Watts became the editor of the Secular Review, which was founded by Holyoke. Charles Watts then emigrated to Canada, and he left the, the publishing company in the hands of his son, Charles Albert Watts, C.A. Watts, who is the founder of our organization. In 1890, the son, Charles, founded the Propagandist Press Committee, together with Holyoke. And here is the announcement in their publication of the time of the Propagandist Press Committee, and I just want to read it to you. This committee has been formed for the purpose of assisting in the production and circulation of high-class liberal publications. The members of the committee are Mr. G.J. Holyoke, Dr. Bithell, Mr. F.J. Gould, Mr. Frederick Miller, and Mr. Charles A. Watts. It is thought that the most efficient means of spreading the principles of rationalism is that of books and pamphlets. Many will read a pamphlet who would never dream of visiting a lecture hall. 
At the quiet fireside, arguments strike home which might be dissipated by the excitement of a public debate. The lecturer wins his thousands, the penman his tens of thousands. The aim of the various writers will be to obtain converts by persuasiveness rather than undue hostility towards the popular creeds. Perhaps a reference to Bradlaugh there. Already over £120 has been subscribed, and all who are in sympathy with the movement are earnestly requested to contribute as liberally as their means will allow. The names of donors will not be published without their consent. Just like we won't film you without asking you. So, that was the Propagandist Press Committee. That became the Rationalist Press Committee soon afterwards, and then they settled in 1899 on a new name, the Rationalist Press Association. The Rationalist Press Association still exists, it is now folded into the Rationalist Association, and in many ways we are one and the same organisation. And the archive out there is the archive of the RPA predominantly, because the RA was only formed in 2002. Uh, what did they do? Well, they were publishers and they published books. And you can see some of the books that are published in, the, in our archive. And they also published a magazine. The magazine started off as something called Watts Literary Guide, which was really just a pamphlet of the things that they were publishing, just a catalogue. And it gradually grew they folded within it something called the Rationalist Review. And then in the 1940s, the whole magazine was rebranded as The Humanist, and then in the 1970s as New Humanist, and we continue to publish today, as I hope you all know, as New Humanist every other month. There were other publications, the Agnostics Annual in the late 19th century, which became the Rationalist Annual. There's a copy of the Rationalist Annual from 1966 and various other things like uh, questions and various things like that. But I think the biggest achievement of the RPA, outside of the magazine, which I would argue that is better now than it was then, but then I would say that, is the wonderful Thinker's Library. The Thinker's Library is, was published between 1929 and 1951, and these were cheap reprints of classic books and also new books designed to disseminate knowledge and democratise knowledge Primarily, I think, to people who did not have a high-level university education who would have encountered these books in their university libraries. So for people who did not have access to that. In 140 books by people like H.G. Wells, Herbert Spencer, Ernest Haeckel, John Stuart Mill, Charles Darwin, Joseph McCabe, T.H. Huxley, J.B.S. Haldane, Tom Paine, Aldous Huxley, Albert Einstein, and of course, J.C. Flugel and G.G. Coulton. Remember? They, they succeeded, I think, in educating a huge generation of people, and we still get people, I still meet people now who think very fondly of the Thinker's Library as a way that first gave them access to, to ideas in a way that they could understand and afford, not just here, but particularly in India as well, because the, the books obviously made it out to the colonies at the time. I want to read a little bit of one of these books, this one. The fairest thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and true science. He who knows it not and can no longer wonder, no longer feel amazement, is as good as dead, a snuffed-out candle. It was the experience of mystery, even if mixed with fear, that engendered religion. A knowledge of the existence of something we cannot penetrate, of the manifestations of the profoundest reason and the most radiant beauty, which are only accessible to our reason in their most elementary forms, it is this knowledge and this emotion that constitute the truly religious attitude. In this sense, and in this alone, I am a deeply religious man. I cannot conceive of a God who rewards and punishes his creatures, or has a will of the type of which we are conscious in ourselves. An individual who could survive his physical death is beyond my comprehension, nor do I wish it otherwise. Such notions are for the fears or absurd egotism of feeble souls. Enough for me the mystery of the eternity of life, and the inkling of the marvellous structure of reality, together with the single-hearted endeavour to comprehend a portion, be it never so tiny, of the reason that manifests itself in nature. Those are the words of Albert Einstein in Thinker's Library number 79, The World as I See It. Now, they were not written for the RPA. Albert Einstein did not write a book for us. We asked his publisher, could we reproduce selections of his work and get it out to a wide audience? You can see the correspondence in the archive between us and the publishers asking for this, and you can also see, very thrillingly, a Xerox, or whatever the equivalent of a Xerox was then, uh, where Albert Einstein agrees to this with his signature on it. Why does this matter? Firstly, I think it matters because I've always heard of Einstein as cited as someone who was a bit religious or had an idea about God who wasn't really a proper atheist. And I think this quote, you might have been familiar with at least the first half of it, puts it firmly in context and tells us that, in fact, the relativity guy wasn't all that relative about religion. 
the idea of that, that the consolations of religion really are for the feeble. Um, quite strong words from Einstein, albeit that he rescues an idea of spirituality for those people who don't have religion, which for me I find very moving. The other thing is, of course, it's very inspiring. This is by no means a cold rationalism. A lot of people mistake rationalism for a kind of coldness or a lack of emotion or a lack of idea about amazement or wonder or spirituality. It's not that. And I find that inspiring, and I think that still inspires what we're trying to do today. Membership of the RPA. Who joined the RPA? Well, when you look at the archive, you can see people who joined or declined to join. Thomas Hardy was too ill to join. Uh, uh, Popper was asked to be the president and said he could only be an honorary associate, but members included Haldane and Bertrand Russell, A.J. Eyre, Sigmund Freud, Murray Stopes, Barbara Wooten, Herman Bondi, and Anthony Flew before he flew the coop, as it were, and decided perhaps God did exist. But who were the members beyond these luminaries and these big names? Well, thanks to the wonderful work of our volunteer, Katie Ashton, who has been doing some fantastic work and who laid out this display for us, we turned up a member's register from 1919. And in that, people listed their occupation. And included in their professions, as well as professors and writers, was barman, builder, soldier, tobacco worker, male nurse, quarryman, miners, artist, jailer's cutter. What's a jailer's cutter? And farmer. So I think that proves that actually what the RPA has always been about is trying to democratize knowledge and bring it out of the gilded tower and the higher echelons of kind of cultural life and bring it for everyone. By 1959, we're told by the archive, the association had reached its highest membership, its membership peak, 5,000 members. Today, membership stands at about 500, of which you are some. So the obvious question is, have we failed? Is this a story about failure? Well, I would say not necessarily, although, of course, I would say that as well, wouldn't I? Because the subscribers to New Humanist currently stand at just a shade under 5,000. Which means, in some sense, we're right back in the heyday of the 1950s. Perhaps we've stood still. Although when I joined the organisation, the combined total of, which was in 2005, the combined total of members and subscribers was less than 2,000. So there's been a growth, quite significant growth, and we're still growing. And we want to grow more. Arguably, the magazine is better. That's for others to judge, but you can look at the history of the magazine. It perhaps went up and down. It was often published infrequently. I mean, in my, uh, it wasn't always uh, bi-monthly as it is now. It wasn't colour. It didn't have as, as much vibe to it, I think, as we've managed to get into it now. But also, what they didn't have in 1950s was 100,000 unique visitors to the website every month. They didn't have 13,500 Twitter followers. They didn't have 5,500 fans on Facebook. No one listened to their podcasts. In January, we launched our iPad app, which has been downloaded thus far about 3,000 times. It's a free app, but you can buy a subscription through the app. 380 people so far worldwide have bought that subscription. So our audience is arguably far greater than the membership of the organization, or indeed even subscribers to the magazine, though, of course, we need subscribers to keep going. Our current list of honorary associates includes Richard Dawkins and Philip Pullman, Ken and Malik and Claire Tomalin, Stuart Hall and Stuart Lee. It's a rich and diverse list. It is not just profs. It's scientists, it's comedians, it's public figures, and it's people like you. I'm not suggesting you're not those as well, of course. <laughs> and of course, the issues that we care about, I'm assuming that we all care about the same issues, or some of them, though we might not agree on how we go about addressing them, and that's part of the joy of being a free thinker and a secularist, is the arguments that we have. Reason, science, clear thinking, freedom of speech, and enter religious privilege, these have hardly gone away, have they? I mean, just pick up the newspapers. And nor has the need to put these values in as clear a language for as wide a possible audience as we can gone away. But it's a different game. It's not a game of things going away. Print hasn't gone away, but we need to do print and we need to do the website. We need to do radio and we need to do podcasts. We need to do pamphlets. We need to do video online. And we need to do events like this. And in fact, events are growing. In the digital age, what people want is to see other people face to face like this, which is a wonderful thing, I think. We have a lot of plans about how we're going to do this. And I'd be very happy to talk to you about it. If you read our literature, we'll be reporting it to you. Make sure we've got your email address so we can stay in touch with you. And we rely on the support of our members and subscribers to do this, which is why I refer you back to what I said earlier, in fact, was said in 1899, all who are in sympathy with the movement are earnestly requested to contribute as liberally as their means will allow. 
And you can see our glamorous assistant accountant, Leslie Stafford, standing at the back with a beautiful print uh, shirt on, who's very happy to take any contribution you're happy to make. And please do uh, feel free to avail yourself of any opportunity we offer you via email or letter or online to support us, come to our events, give us donations, and really move us forward. So that's my little bit. Thank you very much. I'm now going to introduce our chair, Laurie Taylor. Well Are you switched on? Yeah. Let me just say, first of all, it was, uh, this is the first time I've been here, the first time I've been around an exhibition like this, the first time I've uh, been made aware, if you like, in a concrete way of the history of the Rationalist Association. You may say as chair, I should have done a bit more homework, but uh, really, before uh, the Bishopgate uh, Library 